All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Bob Cornell with you. And uh, it's such a, a blessing to be able to be with you today. And uh, I'm looking forward to the time that Covenant Church that we can get back together again. And uh, that should be just in a few more weeks. Uh, I'm excited about it. And I know many churches are, are, are able to get back together. Uh, we're not in that place yet, but it's coming soon. And I'm so thankful for it. Uh, for the Lord keeping us and helping us throughout this whole epidemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Lord is faithful. Uh, isn't that so awesome about God, that God is faithful? And r during this whole crisis, during this whole epidemic, God has been faithful to his people. And, you know, and, and today I want to minister a word that deals uh, somewhat with the character of God and deals with uh, God himself and deals with us as his people in light of the epidemic and in light of really any circumstance that we go through uh, in life. Uh, and so if you have your Bibles today, uh, I'd like you to turn there, if you would, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses uh, 26 through 31. And this morning, I want to get right into the message, and I, I feel I have felt the Lord so strongly deal with me about this passage of Scripture, uh, and it, 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 deals, uh, it deals with the way that God works, and uh, how God works so opposite the way the world works, and the, how God thinks, and how God, again, how God operates so different from the way the world does. And so this morning, I want to minister uh, a message that I'll entitle, Why God Works the Way He Does. And as a subtitle, God's Ultimate Purpose. Uh, you know, God has a purpose in this epidemic that we're going through. God has a purpose in what he's allowed in your life and what he's allowed in my life. When I, when I look back over my life, I, 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 I see that, that God had a purpose in everything that he allowed. And that's one of the greatest joys that you and I as a child of God can, can just know, know in our heart, know, know deep in our spirit that God in the midst of it all, I couldn't see it when I was in it. I couldn't see it when I was in the trial. I couldn't see it when I was in the fire. I couldn't see it when I was in the epidemic. But God, you were working in it all. And God, you had a purpose. And I'm, on a, I'm just going to get right to it. Because in this passage, what Paul would explain and what he would write, it's about God's ultimate purpose. And you might ask, what is that ultimate purpose? God's ultimate purpose in everything that he allows in our life as a child of God is that he would receive the glory. Mm. Let's read it together in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, beginning there for, through verse 31. Paul writes, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the things that are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh may glory in his presence. But then he said in verse 30, but of him, that is of Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Mm, that's a good statement right there. Let him who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It's a good moment right there just to say, thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you in the midst of it all. I don't, it doesn't, and I just encourage you right now. It doesn't matter what you're in. It doesn't matter what you've been feeling recently. If you've been feeling discouraged or if you have been feeling like you don't know 
just what's going on, uh, whatever feelings you might have, I just encourage you right now just to say, thank you, Lord. I give you the glory because you're worthy of the glory. You know, uh, it, it's been stated before that you and I are worth it. We are worth it, but we're not worthy. And that is, that is very much the case. You and I are worth it. We are worth the sacrifice that, of God uh, sending his own son, Jesus, to die for us on the cross. We were worth it. That's our value. We want to know how valuable you are. Just look at Jesus. Look at what he did for you at the cross. Look at what God did for you. That's how valuable you are in the eyes of God. God loves you today. I just want to encourage you to that. God loves you. He cares for you. In the midst of it all, just know this. He loves you. You are worth it. But we're not worthy. And Paul in this passage, that's really what he was uh, dealing with to, 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 to some degree, he was in a sense in this whole passage of first Corinthians, he, he told, he was telling us in words that we were worth it. So worth it that the cross took place, but we are not worthy of the glory. Worthy means deserving. We're not deserving of anything, but we were well worth it. Hallelujah. Praise God. I just, I just, I just can't help but thank God for that right there. I wasn't deserving, but I was worth it. You weren't deserving. You weren't worthy, but you were worth it. And you know, that's the way that God works. In the natural, I would never, ever give my son or give, give my daughter, I would never give my children to, an, to, to lay down their life for an enemy. I would never do that in the natural. It would be way, way beyond my ability to be able to do that. And I think the same thing goes for you and I. It's way beyond us. If there was ever a situation which normally the, this, the, the situations like this don't arise, but if there was ever a situation where you would have to give up your children, give up and maybe give up your only child for the life of an enemy, someone who hates you. That's beyond us to do that. But you know what? That's exactly what God did for us. We were enemies. Every, every single one of us, we were enemies before God. We, were, we are sinners. The Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then he would say in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, and, and I know some might think, well, well we're, this, is, this is a time of, uh, of crisis and you're, and you're talking about what, what, what Jesus did. That's exactly the case because if God provided for us the lamb, if he provided for us our greatest need and that was to be saved from our sins, then it's a guarantee that he'll bring us through every trial. He'll bring us through every epidemic. He'll bring us through every crisis that we go through. You see, the way that God works is different from the way that we work. We want to moan and groan and, and, and sit down in, a, in, a, in, our, in our, our in our pity party, but God says, rise up from that pity party. Rise up from that place of discouragement. Rise up from that place of focusing on what you don't have and, and, and focus on me. Focus on what I provided for you. Focus on my promises that I've given to you, that I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that if I gave you my my son, then I'll freely give you everything that you have need of. Mm. Rise up this morning, uh, child of God. I encourage you. Rise up from that place of, of discouragement if that's where you are. Rise up from that place of focusing on the crisis and focus on Christ. Hallelujah. You know, in, in this uh, or in what we've been going through uh, recently, and I definitely don't want to focus on the crisis. I want to exalt Christ over the crisis. But in this time, 
There's been so many questions that have been asked. I mean, every question you can imagine, uh, uh, people are asking it. Uh, and from a secular or from a physical perspective, people are wondering where, where the virus came from, how it came to be, how it came to pass, how do we protect ourselves from it? Uh, do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? Do we wear gloves? Do we not wear gloves? Uh, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, everything imaginable, and it seems like the opinion changes uh, e e all the time. Uh, questions are being asked and answers are being given, and different questions, different answers, and all that. But you know, in the midst of it all, more important questions are being asked, and those are questions about God. For example, I've heard, I've even asked this question myself, why did God allow it? Every, every, every time a, uh, an epidemic hits or a trial comes uh, or, or, or something happens in our life personally, or in this case, this is not just nation, even a national thing, this is a worldwide thing. And whenever anything happens, especially like this, we should ask the question, why? Or we should ask the question, God, what are you, what, what are you wanting in the midst of all this? What are you trying to do? Know this, there is a treasure in every trial, especially for, for the child of God, for the one who trusts in him, there is a treasure in every trial. You mean right in the midst of this time, God has a blessing for me? Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God has a blessing for you in the midst of it all. And, and if you have experienced loss, God can, God can, and he will give it back. And he'll, when he restores, he restores better than you were when you first started. You see, God, there's questions that are being asked and about, about God. God, why did you allow it? Or where is God in the midst of it all? Where's God? Where's God? <laughs> where is God? Have you, ever, have you ever felt like that? I know I have. I felt like that many times in my life. It's not, it's not a, uh, it, it's a natural uh, question. It's a natural thought. I'm going through a trial, going through a hard season. God, where are you? It, it's funny. Uh, uh, Sharon and I, we were just in, in Florida uh, visiting Samuel and, and his wife, Victoria, and just uh, because we were not having services here and we're not, not able to get yet to gather here. Uh, and so we thought, you know, now's a good time just to go down there and visit them. And we did. And, and we, we, we passed this one church that had a sign and the sign, it, it still reflected the uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday. And the sign of this church said, Christ is risen. He is alive. He is not here. He is online. <laughs> Words to that effect. He is not here. He is online. And I thought, boy, well, that is, and we just got a little chuckle out of that because, because so many churches are having online services. And where's Christ? Well, he's online. He's, he's on the internet uh, ministering to people. Well, where is Christ? Yeah, that's just, you know, just a little uh, joke there. Uh, but, you know, in the midst of it all, Christ is, he's with us. He's never, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm right there with you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whether it's online or offline, it doesn't matter. God is with us. He's not, he's not uh, relegated to, uh, to a church building or he's not, rele he's not uh, uh, re regulated to a uh, to an online service to live streaming. No, God's that's not God. God is with you. He's beyond all those things, and He's with you as His child. His eyes are on you. Where's God? Well, His eyes are on you. You, the apple of His eye. He cares for you, and He loves you. Mm. That's good. Praise God. I'm so thankful that He's with me. I'm so thankful that He's with my family. I'm so thankful that he's with you and he's with your family. And he will see you through everything that, that you go through. He will see you through. You know, in this passage that we read this morning, 
the whole point, especially verses 26 through 28, was is this basically that God, that the way that he works is opposite to the way the world works. That was the whole point of really Paul writing what he did when he said, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the things that are wise. God has chosen the weak he, to put to shame the things that are mighty, the base things of the world and the things that are despised. God has chosen the things that, that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. The whole point of that, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, is God, the way that he works, is so opposite of the way the world works. Well, what, 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 what is the way the world works? Well, Paul, de, Paul defined it as really as the flesh. In verse 26, you see, you, he said, uh, not many, you see, you're calling, brother, that not many of you are are." are are, uh, are wise according to the flesh. You see, the way the world operates is it operates according to the flesh. What is that? The flesh, the way that Paul was using it here, speaks of a mindset and an attitude that is independent from God. Independent from God. And a whole, a whole mindset, a whole attitude, a whole belief system that is relying upon self versus relying upon God and upon what God has given to us in his son, Jesus Christ. That is the world. That's the flesh. Again, a, an attitude of self-dependence, self-reliance, self-glorying, selfishness, pride, 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 unbelief, 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 me, me, me. That is the attitude of the world. Again, a whole attitude that is independent from God, independent from his word, independent from any trust in Jesus Christ. It's an attitude that says, I don't need God. I don't need him at all. I've got my own wisdom. I'm wise. We're wise in and of ourselves. We're mighty. We're strong in and of ourselves. That's the attitude of the flesh. That's the attitude of the world. The world that we live in today and the world the way it has always been. Going all the way back to Cain and Abel, that, and really, really, I should say Adam and Eve, that the, the mindset of the flesh is we can have life without God. That's the mindset of the world. But you see, Paul would write here, in, in a sense, say that what, the way that God works is totally opposite of that. It's totally opposite from that mindset of I can live independent from God or I don't need or I don't or, or I don't need to that degree or, or I don't need that much. You know, Jesus, I, I, just a little dab will do me. No, but th that's not God. A little dab won't do you. That's not the Lord. That's not the mindset of the Lord. Just a little God, just a little Jesus will be all right for me. I can make it with just a, a, a little Jesus or a little talk with Jesus, like the, like the song says, makes it right. Well, I tell you, you don't need just a little talk with Jesus. You need a long talk with Jesus. Yes, yeah, sometimes they're short, but I tell you, sometimes what we need is not just little. We need a lot. And God's attitude towards us is I want you to trust me with all of your heart. I don't want you to give me a little bit. I don't want you to give me a, me a little glory of, in, in your life. I want, I want your whole life to glorify God. I want everything. I want it all. That's the God that we serve. He wants it all. Why? It's because he's deserving of it all. He gave his all for us. Mm. He gave it all. And he wants it all from us so that all the glory goes to him. All the honor, all the credit, everything goes to him. And Paul was saying here that, that the way that the world operates and the way that God I op that God operates is totally totally opposite, and he would he, Paul would would write that that 
that what that the uh, the unsaved world revolves around and is focused on on wisdom that 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 is just that comes from this right here that comes from self that is wisdom it's focused on wisdom that is independent from God you've heard a lot recently we've heard so much in the news recently about science we can trust science have you heard that recently and I know I have I don't know how many times we where, where we need to look to is science you know what that's the mindset of the world that to totally is the mindset of the world and, and not what, what is it? does that mean that we don't uh, we don't involve ourselves in science or, or we don't involve ourselves in the study of, 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 of medicine and things like that. No, no, that's not it at all. But the world's attitude is all we need is science. The world's attitude is our trust is to be in science. That's the world's attitude, not God. Just like just like Governor Cuomo said weeks ago, when there was a little, uh, when when New York City was starting to uh, get better uh, with the epidemic, and he and he blatantly said, he said it's not God and it's not religion that has caused us to get better. It's it's us wearing the mask, it's our social distancing, it's all the precautions that he's, he that it, that we've taken. God has nothing to do with it. That 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 is the mindset of the world. And that's what the world revolves around. He's looking for wisdom that is independent from God. It's looking for, uh, it's looking for that which is noble, Paul would say, uh, uh, wise, and that which is noble, which speaks of, it, it's popular, it's influential. It, it, it's acceptable to the masses. The world is looking for that. That's what it's focused on. It revolves around it. The world revolves around that which is, Paul would say, mighty. Mighty me refers to that which, uh, again, has influence. That which appears uh, strong. That which appears in the natural to be the way to go. But Paul would say that you see, he, he would write those words at the beginning uh, 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 of verse 26. He would write the words, you see your calling, brethren. You see your calling, brethren, that not many are called, not many uh, in the why. Let me find, get it, my place here. He would say, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And I want to begin first, I want to focus on that statement when he said, you see your calling. For you see your calling, brethren. And he used that word calling. That word calling uh, literally refers to an invitation. And really, re it refers uh, to the great invitation of God to mankind to be saved. The invitation to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Not just Savior, but Lord of your life. That's the great invitation of God. That's the calling of God upon every individual. And when one accepts that invitation, accepts that calling to receive what God has provided mankind in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, what happens when a person receives that invitation and they believe what God has given to them? I tell you, they, a person gets saved. Uh, we, we, get, we're, we become justified. We receive everything. We receive redemption. We receive forgiveness of sins. We receive life and life eternal. We, we, have, we receive, a, more than anything, a relationship with God. Mm. We, we receive a relationship with Jesus Christ. We receive a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He dwells on the inside of us. Hallelujah. You see, when we receive that invitation, that calling, and that's really what Paul was talking about. He was talking about re us receiving that invitation by faith. We received that calling. And we got saved and we, and we accepted that salvation that, we, that, that is only in Jesus Christ. And, you know, in, that, in, in our salvation that we have in Jesus is really everything. Everything that we need. 
everything is in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for us at the cross. Every spiritual need is met, even we, and we become a child of God, and by, and by becoming a child of God, he becomes our father, and that means that he's going to take care of us. He'll take care of every spiritual need. He'll take care of every physical need when we trust him, when we trust him, when we give him the glory. Mm. And again, that's what God's wanting. But he said, you, you, you see your calling, brethren, that it, that it, 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 it's, and he said not, that not many are called. And I'm thankful here. Paul didn't say, he didn't say that not any wise or noble or mighty in the eyes of the world are called. But he just said not, he, he didn't say not any, but he said not many. Why? Why is that? It's because those who are wise and uh, mighty and noble in the eyes of the world, in order to receive what really what God has for them, and maybe that was you. Maybe maybe that was you in the eyes of the world. You were you were you were considered wise, mighty, and noble. But in order to receive what God has for us, in order for that person, whoever that may be, if they're popular, if they're mighty in the eyes of the world, if they're very very wealthy, and and their money can can buy them anything, and that it appears in the natural can buy them anything that they want. What happens is that person has to lay it down. I don't, it doesn't, no, I don't mean they have to lay, give up their, their money, give up their status, whatever. But the, the idea is this, a person to receive what God has for them, they have to realize that all their status, their social status of being wise and mighty and noble, it, 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 it gains no righteousness in the eyes of God. It, it gains nothing. It earns no brownie points in the eyes of God. So the, ha the, the person has to humble themselves and lay it down. Like Jesus would say in Luke chapter 9, that a person who loses their life, it's only the person that loses their life will gain their life. <laughs> only the person that loses it will gain it. But Paul would, was writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he's saying that not many will do that. Not many will do that, that have the riches, that have the nobility, uh, that have the, 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 the popularity, all that the, uh, in this world. And the, for the Corinthian believers, most of them were not in that place. They were not in that place of being noble. They were just normal individuals, just like you are, just like you that are watching me right now or those that will watch later. You're not in the eyes of the world. Most are not wise and mighty and noble. You're just a, average, you're a normal individual, you could say, the average Joe. That's the way I think of myself. I'm not anything special. But you know what? God... What he does and what he said, what Paul would say in this passage, in a sense, is that he takes that which is viewed as nothing in the eyes of the world, and he and he takes and he takes that nothing. He takes us nothing and makes something wonderful out of it. Mm, hallelujah! He takes he makes something wonderful out of our life because popularity, wealth, and all those things. They mean nothing. They gain no merit in the eyes of God. But this is what God is looking for. He's looking for a person who will give him all the glory. Who, and we do that by trusting in him. We do that by giving him our life. We, we do that by our dependence upon him. We do that with an attitude that says, God, I can't live without you. Jesus, I can't make it today without you. Holy Spirit, I can't make it without you. I can't, I'm nothing without you. We agree with the words of Jesus in John 15, 5, when he said, without me, you can do nothing. That's the heart. Uh, uh, that's, that's the heart that God's looking for. That's the heart that gives glory to God. Lord, without you, I have nothing. And what, 
what Paul wrote here is he says, in the eyes of the world, Jesus and those who follow Jesus, you know, we are in the eyes of the world, we are foolish. That means we're moronic, we're morons in the eyes of the world. We can't use our brain. We have no brain in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of the world, we are weak. We are base, meaning that we are, we're, we're, we're so ground level that uh, we're like the ants that crawl on the ground. That, that's, the, that's the attitude of the world towards the, Jesus Christ and those who follow Jesus. You're like, man, you are ground, very, very ground level. And, he, and Paul would say we are nothing in the world. That's how they view Jesus, and that's how they view us as nothing. We're nothing. We have nothing. You got Jesus? You got nothing. I got money. I got my boat. I got my house. I got this. I got that. But again, in the eyes of the world, that means absolutely nothing. You see, in this time, as I come to an end, at this time of this epidemic, you know what God is looking for more than anything, especially as, as believers begin to come back and they gather together in churches? You know what God's looking at? God's not looking at the church building. That's not what God is focused on. God, God's not up in heaven with a, with a mindset of, man, I can't wait, you know, until they get back in the church building, then I can really bless them. That's, that's not God, because God's focus is not on the building. God's, not, God's focus is not on how well and how well presented the praise and worship are, is or how professional it is or how good it sounds. That's not God. God's not, God's not focused. He's not looking at how well the presentation of the preacher is. This suit that I'm wearing right now, I just this morning, you know what? I could have wore blue jeans and a T-shirt. But I just felt like, you know, I want to wear a suit. I just want to wear a suit and tie this morning. But you know what, God? God's not focused on this right here. He's focused on my heart. And he's focused on your heart. That doesn't mean that we don't, shouldn't dress right at times. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't come and gather into the house of God. Of course not. Of course not. That doesn't mean that God is not looking at your pocketbook he actually he is he's looking at your at your pocketbook but more importantly he's looking at your heart because what you do with your pocketbook what you do with your wallet is just a reflection of your heart god's looking at you he's looking at you today you're the apple of his eye and more than anything he just wants you to give him the glory in the midst of it all in the midst of it all, I, I, I just want to encourage you that in Jesus, you have everything. In Jesus and what he's done for you, you have everything. Everything you need is in him. You have God as your father and God as your father. You have everything. Oh, I'm, I, I remind you of Matthew chapter 6. The great do not worry passage of the Bible. Jesus told the disciples, the multitudes, I should say, and the disciples that were there, and he told us as well. He would say, look at the, the birds. Look at the, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the grass. He said, your father takes care of them. Think about that for a moment. That's what Jesus said. He said, look at the birds Look at the lilies of the field and look at the grass. Even the grass is cut down and, and the next day it withers, it's burned in the fire. He said, look at all those things. Your father takes care of them. He takes care of the birds, the lilies, and the grass. And he said this, you are of much more value than them. Mm. You are of much more value than them. Why? It's because Jesus didn't come to redeem the birds, the lilies, or the grass. Event, yes, eventually creation will receive a, a resurrection itself to some extent, but he didn't die for that. No, he died to redeem you. He gave his life for you. And he would say, so don't worry about, don't worry about the things in the natural. Don't worry about your house. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about 
where you're going to be, what's, where you're not going to be. Don't, 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 don't stress. Don't stress out about those things. But he said this, but do this in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's Jesus. The kingdom of God and his righteousness, you know what that is? That's God's authority. That's God's power. That's God's kingdom. That's all found in the king, Jesus Christ. Seek first. Put him first. Don't put your job first. Don't, don't even put your church first. Put, don't put pastor first. Don't put any person. Put God first first. Put Jesus first. Make him the priority of your life. And Jesus said this, and all these things shall be added unto you. Everything. God will take care of you. God will see fit that he takes care of you. It may not, it may not always be easy, but he'll take care of you. And in the midst, and, and in the midst of it all, I just want you to give God a saying, I just want you to give me glory. Just give God the glory. You know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, Paul would say, he said, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. But of him, of God, you are in Christ Jesus. That's you today. You're in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I don't have the time to go through the explanation of all of those words right there. But in Christ, as I said earlier, in Jesus, we have everything that we have need of. Everything. He is our wisdom. He's our know-how. He's our, what do I do next? He's that. He knows. He has it. Mm. He's our wisdom. He is our righteousness. And we're in Christ. He's, we're, he is our righteousness. He is our redemption. We've been bought with the blood of Christ. We, that mean, what, does that, what does that mean? He is our redemption. That means that we are God's. You're God's possession today. You are owned by God. Mm. And he's our sanctification. He's the one who's sanctifying you, changing you into the image of Jesus Christ. In the midst of all this crisis, I mean, we have that? Yes, we have all that. In the midst of it all. Why? But Paul would, he would close it out in verse 31. Why? That as it is written, let him who glory, glories, let him glory in the Lord. What is God looking for? Why does he do what he does the way he does it? Because God wants glory. God wants to receive the glory. I know there's some things in my own family that I know God's working it out God's working it out and when he and I and we can see the hand of God working we can see the enemy trying to stop it but you know what God's going to receive the glory God's receiving glory God is he's receiving glory and he's going to receive glory in your life maybe there's a situation right now Maybe in your family, maybe in your own life personally, that you don't understand. Maybe you've been bound by confusion or fear or paranoia. Paranoia about yourself, paranoia about the future, paranoia about your family. Paranoia about the economy, paranoia about this, paranoia about that. I just want to encourage you today. God's not given you the spirit of fear or paranoia type of fear, which is an ungodly fear. He's not giving that to you, but he's given you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. He just wants you to rest in him, trust him, and give him glory. Give him glory. Things that look, things, things that look so bad. I, I, I'm here to tell you today from personal experience when I've seen things in my life or my own family that looked so bad, that looked like they were irreversible, I tell you, God, when we committed to God, God can turn it around just like he did in the book of Esther, just like he did with David and Goliath, just like he did with Israel coming out of Egypt, 
just like he did with Gideon, Gideon's army of 300 against the army of well over 100,000. Just like he did at the cross. The cross, the crucifixion of Christ looked like it was over. It looked like it was over. But it wasn't over. It wasn't defeat. It was victory. And three days later, he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. I just encourage you today, give him the glory. Let him be your focus. Let him be who your mind is meditating on. Let him be, uh, let your words that come out of your mouth be edifying and glorifying to God. Let him not be uh, complaining or, or bickering about that or about this, but let your words be glorifying to God. Let your thoughts be glorifying to God. Give him your heart. Lord, it's yours. I give it all to you. Hallelujah. Would you do that today? If you don't know Jesus today and you need to give him your heart, you can give him your heart right now. And I encourage you right now, if that's you, you don't know Jesus, you've never accepted him in your heart to be your Savior and Lord, you can do it right now. Right now, right where you're at, just say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Come on, tell, you can tell God that. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner before you. But I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And I ask that you would forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. I believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for my sins to save me. <laughs> and I believe that Jesus died and he rose again. That he's alive. Come on, you can say that. I believe that Jesus rose again. He's alive. He died for my sins and he rose again. He's alive. And just ask him right now. Say, Jesus, would you, I believe you, would you come into my heart to be my Savior and Lord? I give you my life because you gave your life for me. Come into my heart. Change me. I'm yours. Hallelujah. Praise God. I pray that some right now did that. Maybe you're watching this later. I pray that you would do that. If you're a child of God already, there's always more of a heart that we can give to Christ. There's always more of our life that we can give to him, more of our thought life that we can give to him. Less of us and more of Jesus. I want to say it again, less of us and more of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you today. I want to pray as I end. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, for every individual that's watching right now, everyone who will watch later. And I ask you, Lord, for your blessing to rest upon them in the name of Jesus. I pray that God, for, the, that, that, for those who, who do not know you, I pray that God, their hearts would be pierced, their hearts would be convicted, that, that the Lord, they would receive you. I pray for those who have said that prayer, who have received you into their heart right now, this today. I pray for them, and I ask that you would encourage them, strengthen them. Lord, I thank you for bringing, giving them a brand new life in you, Jesus. I pray for believers, for all of us, that we would give you more, that it would be more of you and less of us, Jesus, that you would increase and we would decrease, that you would receive all of the glory that our life would give you glory. Yes, Father. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God loves you today. We love you. We look forward to being uh, back with all those of Covenant Church here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, if you'd like to look more, see more of what, of what we have, look at, the uh, again, the Cornell Ministries page here on Facebook or go on our website, cornellministries.com. If you'd like to give a gift, you can give it there, cornellministries.com. And uh, we love you again today. But more importantly, God loves you. He cares for you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus Christ.